Um, I, I brought new poetry today, and um, they're on old themes. Uh, I definitely tend to write a lot about um, the concept of home, whether it's here or there, depending on how you feel. Um, and um, I guess the past two years, I have been writing a, a lot of illness narratives uh, in prose, but um, recently with poetry. So I brought um, quite a few of those. So the first poem I'll read is called How to Identify the Author at a Reading. Introducing the accent, but that is surface and only the ear can skate on it. How can an eye see such things as a vowel broken into two syllables, the taste of a country's consonants, or more to the point, something is slightly different here. Here is the skin of the northern hemisphere. Moles are only freckles we have known personally, tainted by a foreign sun, and this is a poem in blemishes. Under her dress is a belly, feral with what it has done. Never having secrets, it spilled forth again and again, and everybody knew it. She keeps saying if we take away words, we are left with a belly. She keeps saying it at all of the readings. Um, and I suppose I, I, I write about bellies and babies a lot, too. <laughs> uh, this one's called The Sick Room. Here he is, entering, though still, a painting hung in the doorway. Once he learns to breathe again, the room is fetid and sticks in his throat. You offer him your eyes, which have seen new things, and none of them have names. There is darkness between you, but outside is sunshine and so much sex. Silverfish, earwigs, mice going at it. And for once, he does not imagine going at it with you. You who are too weak to starve. He who holds a bowl of soup. He offers to feed you spoonfuls of himself, of heavy shoulders and deep silences after the clock chimes on the hour. It is what he can do. He had an ass to get off here, but isn't this where the bus stopped? Isn't this where planets align to form a path for a burning star shooting through before it disappears? Here he is, and when you swallow him by the spoonful, you are a tree growing so slowly no one can tell except the earth. You are a circle of rain before it becomes a drop, a blooming thing, a shared thing, his very heart on your hungry tongue. And I'll just explain what um, Meniere's disease is because um, probably you haven't heard of it. Um, it's an inner ear imbalance <coughs> disorder. And this uh, sounds like a shell uh, in one ear all the time. Um, so <laughs> fullness is, is often what people refer to it as. And you can get quite um, just day to day, pretty dizzy off and on. But um, the worst of days, if you've ever had too much to drink and the room just spins, it can be like that for hours. So, um, so it's just basically a vertigo and, and noise in your ear. Um, and I've tried to write about it a lot and, and did find that it's a difficult thing to write about without sort of sounding <laughs> like you want everybody to pity you. So I've been working on it for a long time. And this is the first poem I liked that I wrote. And it is called Trying to Write About Many Years Disease. So I found it, yeah, just a difficult thing to do. One, it was a sad day when you came to realize your body would never be glamorous holding on to the spinning earth. But did you consider it just might be closer to nature than all those other conventional bodies because it was spinning too? Why did you say dizzy when the word is like giddy? Is not falling more appropriate to a bottom dweller with a head that follows like a little brother? Tin tomatoes, pepperoni, soy sauce, cheeses, baba ganoush bought in a plastic container and the crackers which carried it to your guilty mouth. You must avoid salt, though your body craves it, being so full of the ocean. You are a lost fish. Your home is an eddy. You write about sickness in bubbles plucked from underwater screams, but it cannot be an art form if the words pop before they are written. How could anyone read them? Too many times you've wondered if each word is monotone, why then should we sing? What is it to say poetry saves when bile dribble stains your favorite dress? Or to say you're tired of backstroking in a circle when you close your eyes to the glaring sun? Or to say when you are sleeping in your rocking bed which rides upon waves, you or yourself are dreaming that you've wrapped your body in a swinging cocoon and will emerge days later, wings and all. 
too. You have forgotten silence. You never had to put it into words because you'd always known it is the earth's phantom limb. And you too have felt like that. Maybe more a phantom tongue than a leg while silence was a nostril inhaling everything. Now you try to place it, throwing letters like paint on a wall, writing poems all through the untamable sky, the soundlessness of ants or the photosynthesis of plants. You edit relentlessly, knowing silence is a big word, like hatred and death, so best to avoid it altogether. Still, you want to write about the sound in your left ear. You want to say it as time's drone measuring the molecules swimming past your head, or time's trick of letting loose the dam that will take you under. But it is not natural to speak without the words you've lost and miss the noise. No, none of this is natural. Three. Once you wore a dress which fits you perfectly. Health spilled from the top of the open neckline and below the slackened hem. Your curves were so round against the silk that your body danced whenever you moved. Writing in it was like doing the rumba in your seat, sometimes ballet. Now it is like you have taken it out of the wash to find it shrunken and dripping and torn down the middle, the threads of the seams only just hanging on. When you hold it up, you see the color has faded as have the trees, as have the faces of your loved ones. Your favorite painting can no longer tell its story. All are shavings of dead skin filed from the memory of your earth-worn heels. Now you have a fishtail and are growing fins. You have no need of dresses because your scales would only snag the fabric. Now you are resigned to turn to the place you crawled out of millions of years ago, thinking that somewhere there must be a coral reef. This is called gift. Feeling claustrophobic while bare seems contradictory. Even when the clouds, even with the clouds crouching like huddles of ellipses, wanting to form raindrops, but too patient in the hanging, too content with the weight. This is where I finally admit I've lost control. Under the dramatic setting of sky being eaten by the clouds and the clouds eating themselves. It is almost complete but not quite. Like learning to die before you die, or accepting an empty bowl and eating from it. A short one. Um, this is a domestic one. I think I've, I feel quite happy situated in a domestic poem. It's called The Kitchen Floor. I have no handle on linoleum, only sweep the dust of our lives caught in the crevices of our living only spot clean where the dog drooled, the black earth stuck. Only complain I should be writing a poem about lino and other things which make this house a home. I chose red like the deserts of Utah for the living room wall where fire burns. Utah, where faces appear in stones and sand slows you down. We once said that Utah, outside of Adelaide, was the only place we felt at home. The red wall singing of a woman painting the home she left behind within the home she now has. Wood splinters on the rug, the dog's hair, nesting dust, Legos and socks. I put up my feet, stare at the wall, seeking my space to breathe. I have no handle on clean. Think of the mice, the summer ants. Remember the day I went to bed and rose three weeks later? Our bedroom became the house, or all I needed to know of it the kitchen and its liveliness giving me the spins while my feet stuck fast to the linoleum floor. Give me a broom or give me death, leaning against the cupboards, and I chose the closest option, a bed in a dozen literary novels handpicked to make me weep. The house moaned, the house creaked, the third baby got by without me. I left her and you and our two boys to a living which gathered in the crevices, and I swept it up when I had healed. When the heat waves came, we left our house and inflated the pool under the oak tree. I waded to my calves. They pretended life was an ocean. Sometimes our skin slipped on the stink of skin on skin. Sometimes we slept outdoors. Sometimes the kitchen was Gretel's oven, distant as that gingerbread house, because nothing's real at 46 degrees. It might as well be a fairy tale. Adelaide's heat is wild like sex, and the kitchen is no place to be. The bed so soppy, sinking in its purple duna, and the living room drips like, a blood, like blood in a bead of sweat. Yet after that month in Utah, we came home and filled the space 
such enormous space for the five of us. And we looked around as if it were our first time in a foreign land, the first time we'd seen our home, the first time we'd opened the blinds and let the rays of the sun wash the lovely grit from the linoleum on the kitchen floor. We have hardwood floor now in the kitchen. <laughs> My life has just gotten so much better. <laughs> This, um, this poem I just wrote um, three days ago, so um, if I stumble through it, uh, at least I'm not writing with a pen. <laughs> it's called The Effects of Hormones on a Female Patient. The bloodless months, babies only apo apostrophes, entrenched and needy, so much energy in the forming, rushing around, sound in my ear as their bodies surfed on waves, frequent and strong, morning sickness all day long, but amplified by the disease, squatting like I was already giving birth, the altar, my loo, spinning while I slept too. When my babies drank, no blood for months, then faintly its return, modest uterus bowing to breasts. I floated in stillness, sedated on duty and love, the quiet waters growing sons and daughters, and the waves consuming themselves in awe. Now I am bleeding. Inside me, walls are peeling their swollen cells. It is well known, traumatically so. Just as fever burns or mucus makes riverways out of a passageway for air, sickness begets waves. Blood is the same. This is my body in April. This is my body in May. Hey. <laughs> So if I had to try to write about mini ears, sometimes I have to talk about mini ears. So this is called trying to talk about mini ears. And um, I found this to be a really tra traumatic experience in my life. And uh, I think I wrote this poem a year after it happened and it felt great to finally, finally talk about it, even though I was writing about it. It's a little bit long, so bear with me. Um, trying to talk about mini ears disease. One, it's been a long time since you've been to the doctor. The last one laughed when you told him acupuncture keeps your illness at bay. You know it's unpredictable. Minier's disease is unpredictable. You've always known this because, in fact, you live with it. He says, maybe it just hasn't come back because it's unpredictable. Maybe it hasn't come back because it's unpredictable. And don't forget you've been having babies. How could you ever forget that? There are three of them. The <laughs> oldest one knows where you keep the needles and the stematil. Pregnancy does funny things to the body. Yes, you have to admit that pregnancy did do funny things to your body, like make your bladder feel fuller faster, like make your feet and back ache if you stood for too long, like make your stomach huge while you grew three humans. It's highly likely it's not the acupuncture. And then he laughed, as if something was funny. You found nothing to be funny at all. Without voice, boulders speak with their bodies, loudly, then sit in silence. Two. It's been a long time since you've been to the doctor. They always say there's nothing they can do, so what has ever been the point? There's no treatment, and short of surgery, that might cause you to go deaf in your bad ear while you anticipate the possibility of it coming back in your good one, there is no cure. But acupuncture keeps the illness at bay. Still, you need to talk about new discoveries. Maybe there are new drugs for the very worst days when you cannot get out of bed to get to your acupuncturist. And there aren't new discoveries or drugs. But he wants to examine you while you're there, Make sure it's definitely Meniere's disease that you have. You are sure it's Meniere's disease you have. You've lived with it for the last 14 years. He asks you to march in place with your eyes closed and arms held out. And when you do, you are dizzy and fall awkwardly to the cold, hard floor, knowing that tomorrow there will be a bruise. Wind holds heaviness when it speaks. So much to say. Leaves tremble and fall. Three. This doctor tells you to lie on the table and hang your head off of it so that you are upside down. You would never want to be upside down. You have Meniere's disease. <laughs> when he turns your head in the direction of your bad ear, the room begins to spin, a full-blown attack, though acupuncture has kept them at bay for the last two years. Stop, you say, you gag, you cry, stop. This is the treatment, he says, this is the treatment. The room spinning so violently, your eyes cannot keep up nor your stomach, and as you gag and cry and tell him to stop, he says, I know, though you're sure that he does not. 
and finally he lets you rise you are vomiting into a dirty bin. You have benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, he says. I thought I had many ears, you say, desperation crowding your tiny voice like a cartoon figure looking up with very big eyes. You do, he says, smiling, as if it's a funny joke. I have both, you ask. You must be lucky, he laughs. And it is like the last doctor, laughing when you want to talk about your illness, which is serious. It has always been serious, and unfortunately always will be. But then he tells you that you will be better now, and you tell him that you were fine when you came into his office. <laughs> Even though the attack has exhausted you and will take days of rest to recover from, he tells you not to lie down for 48 hours. You must sleep sitting up. <coughs> Broken bodies lie when they try to tell the truth, just like a sunset. Four, you won't be going to the doctor again. The last one raped you, though there were no genitals involved. He held you down, and chaos reigned as the room spun so fast your eyes could not keep up, nor could your stomach, and you cry whenever you think about it. You cannot stop thinking about it, and now you are an insomniac. You have Meniere's disease, and it has become such a beast lately that even regular sessions of acupuncture are slow going. You want to write a letter to the doctor and tell him he was wrong. The treatment for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo did not work because, in fact, you have Meniere's disease. You want to ring him and tell him of the, the trauma of a full-blown attack, that he had no right to force you back to the darkness of your illness when you had entered his office a more or less healthy woman. But you are warned against it by a female doctor who says he is very senior. Nothing will happen. He is very arrogant and will probably laugh. She says you should only do it if talking about the incident will make you feel better. You cannot feel better. You have Meniere's disease. Screaming is easy. Just listen to bird song at dusk and boulders, and wind. Um, I did bring my daughter to Melbourne with me. Uh, she was going to come here today, but she got a better offer from my, friend, my friend's um, partner. They have a daughter, so <laughs> he's, he's uh, more fun than probably this room to her. So, <laughs> so she's missed out. But. Um, um, Friday, she was homesick, and she asked me to write a poem ab about the pigeon in, in, um, that we'd found, the baby pigeon. And so I said, oh, I will, I will. So I wrote this for fr on Friday for her, and it's, it's her birthday poem. I thought I would read it to her today, but we'll just read it anyway. It's got nothing to do with <laughs> this reading otherwise. <laughs> and it's called The Poem About the Bird. The shears almost killed them. An egg cracked open the new birds squirming in skin and down. I lifted you to see the secret in the bush, and it yawned. Even so young, a body knows when to grasp air. The mother returned to the nest after I left, letting the warmth of her squab calm her heartbeat. Such a violent morning of music and dogs and crashing branches, and that is how they survived the night. I kissed you as I always do when putting you to bed, only this time I was thinking of birds. In the morning, there were feathers on the grass, the underside ones, which cover breath. I was afraid to part the curtain of leaves and find only the bush I had let go wild. The squab was there, stretching and darker, waiting for her mother. Birds sang out from every tree and flew to roofs and wires and other trees. It was spring. When the pigeon came back, you had a fever, but did not want to go inside, afraid our dog might, might hurt the birds. I bathed you in eucalyptus water, then sat you in the sun, the towel falling from your naked skin. You were sleepy when I read you poems, repeated favorite lines, and explained them to you while you said through yawns, that's beautiful. Our dog guarded me while I guarded you, while you guarded the pigeon, which guarded the squab. I'll just stop there. <laughs> Thank you.